Hare Krishna, Krishna Chitra Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very Hi, much. Please accept my humble obeisances. Chaitanya Chara and Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. Nice to be. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Nice to be back with you. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much for being here. It's been, you know, it's really one of the first times when I'm doing a Monks podcast on the same, on a similar subject, on a theme going on multiple sessions. And it's, uh-huh. it's it, uh, it creates some amount of uh, sort of eagerness among the readers and also stimulates thought in the direction, which I'm also finding it absorbing. So, yes. thank you for that. And it's also uh, giving me also something to focus <laughs> some yes. meditation on, especially now in, in this uh, Kartik month, uh, Das Avatar. Uh, is a nice meditation. Yes, Maharaj, definitely. So today, I think we are to discuss um, Varaha Dev? No, Vamana Dev. No, Varaha Dev. Varaha Dev, sorry, yeah, Varaha Dev. I got, just got the words wrong. So, Varaha Dev. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, I... In the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam classes here in uh, Govardhan Eco Village, they are doing a study of the full, all that um, Srimad Bhagavatam. So they're having like covering four chapters or three chapters per day in one and a half hours. So wow. during, this, during this COVID time, they thought of having a different kind of Bhagavatam class where... So it's high speed turbo Bhagavatam. Turbo Bhagavatam, yeah. So, but still they're having good attendance for the Bhagavatam uh, classes. Uh-huh. And right now the, now the seventh canto is going on. So... Uh-huh. And they had asked me to speak a few, uh, maybe a month or month or two ago on the third canto, uh, on the uh, section on the this Varhadev pastime. So I had uh-huh. studied it at that time. And uh, do you have some f- framework you would like to take or should I suggest something? How we t- take the discussion? Uh, well, the frame, if we're talking about frames, I think uh, the, the frame story uh, of uh, the cursing of Jai and Vijay is mm-hmm. is one principle. Another yeah. another theme, I think, is the saving of the earth, which is uh, relevant nowadays with climate change and eco disaster and so on. Yes, Maharaj. I think both are both are both are. There's a lot to discuss on both themes. You know, because there's something like yeah. predest- predestination and. So maybe you could take both one by one, if that's okay with you. One by one, yes. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. So uh, uh, I'll start with a question that comes to my mind. Currently, I'm writing a book on the Ramayan, where I'm analyzing uh-huh. something like a human nature, analyzing human nature based on the Ramayan. So, uh-huh. so now, so I just wrote an article for Back to Godhead on, like, are some people incorrigible? So was Ravana, for example, was he incorrigible? Could, there are so many efforts given to, uh, um, efforts made to make him see sense, but he didn't. He was yeah. the same thing with Duryodhana. So yeah. now at one level, we understand that everybody has free will and if they, they can misuse their free will. But, uh, so if somebody is cursed to be demoniac, then it's cursed to be a demon, then does that mean that their sense of agency is taken away because of that? Or does it mean mm. that they just have a sense of, incl- they have that kind of inclination? And that means that they will be pushed to act in that way, but they can counter push if they want. So a curse from a previous life, how much does it control? Does it control a person's situations? Does it control a person's disposition? Does it con- control other person's decisions also? So, I mean, it raises some philosophical questions broadly. Yes. Um, well, we could, also, we could also bring this question, so to say, from the other side. Um, okay. We see a person behaving in some nasty way. Okay. And we wonder what is the cause. And... The modern way to look at cause, of course, begins with this life. (laughs) And then it's always a question of uh, 
how much is nature and how much is nurture, right? Yes. And it seems the modern leftist thought goes more and more toward nurture itself. So it's like social yeah. engineering is said to be the, what is the, I read a very succinct statement about the difference between say the left and the right or capitalism and, uh, and communism. It says that the idea within communism is that people are born good, society makes them bad. Uh, whereas, you know, in capitalism, the idea is people are born different and society sometimes accentuates their differences. So, so yeah, I think nature nurture is, is a fundamental issue. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Yes. <laughs> so the, the, you can say the, the, one of the common answers in, to this question in the, in our literature, especially in the Puranas, is uh, the cause can be traced to a previous life. And in, and in this case, the question of the curse, the idea of the curse is, is interesting. Um, for one thing, it's interesting, the whole notion of cursing is interesting because it suggests uh, the power of, of speech, what they call speech act. Yeah. A speech act is, is when, when some, if someone says something, it actually makes that statement creates a reality. And the example is given of the, the, the judge on the bench um, giving a sentence to uh, someone on trial. So the making of that statement determines that person's life, you know, life imprisonment. Woo! Okay, that's it. Uh, and mm -hmm. that comes just from a speech. You can say that's a kind of speech act. Or on the positive side, uh, the, the priest tells the, the couple, I pronounce, at least in the West, I pronounce you man and wife. <laughs> mm. So now, boom, they're married just by that pronunciation. So a curse is something like that. I pronounce you condemned uh, to take birth in the material world, etc. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and uh, so it points to the power of language and of course, it points to the power of another agent to uh, affect our lives. Mm -hmm. For someone, and of course, cursing is one side, the other side is blessing. I bless you that you X, Y, or Z. Yes. So in the case of Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu, who are Jai and Vijay in their previous life, they are cursed by the four Kumaras to take, take birth and, as demons. Uh, and Lord Vishnu comes and Lord Narayan and says, oh, thank you. <laughs> Actually, this is my desire. <laughs> and why is it the Lord's desire? Because um, he always has multiple purposes. One of them is to, to have some good uh, wrestling, some good fights. Hmm. And that's, what's going to, that's what's going to be described in some detail uh, in this Varaha Lila. But to your question, I mean, that's always, uh, that's the ongoing question, which nobody seems to have a completely... Uh, comprehensive answer to uh, mm. it, it's sort of it's it's a species of the question of um, destiny versus free will, isn't it? Yes, that's true. So I was just making I just making some notes when you're typing when you're speaking. So I was just thinking that as I mentioned, the three things, the situations, like in, if we look at our lives. There are some situations we face, there are some dispositions we have, and there are some decisions we make. 
so in the both examples that you gave uh, of uh, speech acts i had also heard the word performative utterance for that an utterance mm. which leads to performance they both in one sense create situations say yes. you are sent, you are sentenced to prison for a life or whatever so mm. they they now at least in the for second first example of uh, judge it's primarily the uh, situation that is controlled now we could say in that situation the j prisoner the convict might associate with other prisoners that might also affect the affect the disposition but that act itself is only considering the situation now if we consider the with respect to marriage it is a situation it is more in terms of legally and socially a particular situation is created and depending on how how seriously the couple takes their marriage vows a certain disposition may also be created at that time mm-hmm. so now it seems that disposition depends not so much on the utterance of those words but it depends on we could say prior disposition of the couple itself so whether how seriously how sacred or how serious they consider the marriage vows to be then that, to that extent the the ceremony of marriage will be uh, the wedding ceremony will be taken that much seriously by them Mm. but it doesn't seem to directly affect the disposition and right. and we could say the decisions well the situations do affect our decisions but it's more like we could say they affect the range of the decisions they're not the specific decision itself so okay in the sense that uh, yes if somebody is in jail mm-hmm. they can't go out of the jail but what do they do in the jail they quarrel with others or they learn something they do some constructive courses and they come out so that that kind of decisions are up to them so actually yeah please no you finish and and i have an interesting example for prison okay. that i just heard go okay. ahead so, so i was thinking about when people are cursed so there is there is definitely a dramatic change at the physical level so now we could place the physical also in situation situation can be the circumstance situation can also be the body the soul is in so with the body it seems a certain kind of disposition comes with it so now here there is a, there is a, there is the case of rutrasur who seems to behave just like a demon up to a particular point and then suddenly his devotional tendency awakens so that is as far as i have read i haven't seen any uh distinctive explanation for how the devotional tendency suddenly awakens maybe it is just he's confronting death and then that time it happens so it does seem that the disposition also is affected to some extent because here changing the situation is not the situation alone it's also the body so that also raises some other questions but i would like to hear what you <laughs> what do you want to say about the about the prison then we can move forward uh just a few days ago uh discussing with his holiness chandra mali swami uh you may know he uh has been doing a lot of preaching in prisons over the years oh yes i have seen some of his books the holy jail he's, and quite he's inspiring he's published a couple yes he's yes. published i think two books on the subject so he told a story of one convict uh who was sentenced uh to um capital punishment to death mm-hmm. uh for you know some terrible crime i don't know murdering some someone whatever and this person encountered um shila prabhupad's books and devotees and they had some meetings and he got into bhagavad gita yeah and the time came for him to uh he was on death row there was no going back so uh it was his day to go to whatever it is the electric chair and the guards reported that they'd never experienced anything like this he went cheerfully <laughs> oh amazing he went completely ready to go it was like yes this is what i 
I deserve and uh, this is going to purify me and the next life can only be better. <laughs> that was his con that was his mood. <laughs> so so that's an interesting profound transformation you can say. These are going to purify me. That's a big that's a remarkable thought to have to. Yeah. Okay. So as for Ravana yeah, as I remember, uh, in some version, it said that the, he had 10 heads and nine of them were trying to advise him uh, to give up this idea of, of uh, taking Sita, but he wouldn't listen. So even with all the good advice... So that's a strong case for disposition being uh, un unchangeable. Um, but then there's his brother, <laughs> Vibhishana. And as we know, Vibhishana surrenders to Lord Ram. He gives up, uh, he gives up Ravana. He sees that Ravana is a hopeless hopeless case and uh, he he then goes over and surrenders to Rama hmm. so it seems like from that perspective the the Ramayana is uh, is saying there's both possibilities of course Vibhishan he he does he didn't have any curse on his head which pushed him to behave in a particular way so although yeah. he he did have a he had, did have a demoniac birth, that means yeah. there, there is a, there is birth in a demoniac species, and does so it seems that doesn't necessarily by itself create a <coughs> demoniac disposition completely. Mm? Right, because Prahlad is the example of the he's the counter example to disposition being completely determined for for the demonic so called demonic species oh yes he's a sterling example i think krishna also in the gita says that prahladana pradam asmi daityanam that among the daityas i am prahlad he gives right. one of the opulences but again the 16th chapter when krishna talks about the divine and the demoniac natures he uses the word, after listing the qualities he says abhijato si bharata or abhijato si pandava that the, the yes. divine and the, the godly and the ungodly people are born with these particular natures. So these are the qualities they are born with. So now if we talk about qualities, then they are associated with disposition. Uh, so again, we could say probably disposition also is a complex thing. And there could be some inclination in that direction, but it might not be a, that forceful an inclination. Mm, it could be. But it seems Vibhishan, he didn't have any demoniac inclination at all. Prahalad also, it is, if there was any tension in their lives, it was not the inner tension between their dark side and their, uh, their virtues and their vice. The tension was there whether they could go against the demoniac situation they were in, the demoniac relations that they had. So yeah. they were almost like... Uh, complete exceptions we could say so in a like almost a society where everybody is dark and they were white <laughs> so <laughs> yeah now i'm just thinking about hiranyaksha to bring it back to our avatar yeah. yes. of the day um hiranyaksha was just reading before he he meets varaha he uh he sort of bursts out uh, after being born and he's already in this fighting mood mm. looking for trouble. But it mentions in one verse that his, he wanted to fight to please his brother. Okay. He, wanted to, he wanted to please Hiranyakashipu and therefore he was fighting. And I was thinking... This Hiranyaksha, how, 
how evil or non-evil is he? He's, um, you know, he's he's a troublemaker. Um, he doesn't care about anyone. So in in certain ways, but is is he really evil? I wonder. <laughs> He doesn't seem to be, he seems to be very straightforward for one thing. Straightforward in the sense, I think when he goes to Varuna also, he says that, you know, I want somebody to fight with me. I want to show my promise. Yeah. So, yes, I want to fight somebody. You're a good person to fight. Let's fight. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a interesting point. You know, maybe about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, in our one of in our one of temples, we had got some. It was a part of the fundraising initiative, so they had got some professional team of drama maker drama doers, and they had done a fundraising. They had done the drama of Krishna Lila, Krishna Birth. For the first time, they had done that, and uh, so there they had depict, depicted Kamsa as performing lots of atrocities on the common citizens. Mm. Mm. So maybe you know, stealing away the land from people, you know, capturing women and abusing them, and doing all kinds of things. Now, mm. I had not read that in the Bhagavatam, or for that mm. matter, in the Acharya's commentaries also. So, in general, uh, the characters we see, the evil characters in our scriptures, uh, are they? Are they evil because they are uh, they are particularly against the godly and God, or are they evil because they are doing terrible things in society? Now, some of them are definitely doing disruptive things. Uh, so, Duryodhana Ravana abducted many women. He is he destroyed kingdoms and he killed and ate sages, and his associates were doing that. So, with Ravana, that is true, but with say Duryodhan, there is not much description that Duryodhan was. Actually, exploitative of the citizens. There are some. No, scholars. it's more the opposite. It's more the opposite. They it said that Duryodhan was a very good, a very good leader, isn't it? Well, he definitely had some amount of leadership skills. In fact, I saw one book about which the whole book was about the leadership qualities of Duryodhan. It was a little uh -huh. counterintuitive, but he was able yeah. to keep his ninety-nine brothers with him. He was able to form a big alliance with many kings. That's how he got such yeah. a big army. But then you could also make the point that maybe he still wanted to, because the Pandavas were still alive, so he didn't manifest his demoniac nature because he wanted to, the citizens to be with him. And uh, when there would be no challenge to his power, then his evil nature might have come out more. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's hypothetical. So I was just going to say that's very hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some characters we do know they are evil, but Hiranyaksha. So in that sense, the seventh canto, if you see Hiranyakashipu, he actually makes a plan to destroy the fire sacrifices and to to, to disrupt society in general, which would yeah. cause the devtas to also get disturbed. So he seems to be much more of a social disruptor than Hiranyaksha. Although it is mentioned that Hiranyaksha uh, says at one point, we will kill Vishnu, and by killing Vishnu, all of the Brahminical, all the Devas, all the Brahmins, all whatever they do will be finished. So he seems to have a similar, he does seem to have a similar plan as Hiranyakashipu. That's true. Um, mm. One doesn't really get a sense of why. The only thing I saw with Hirany Hiranyaksha, his only motivation seems to be to please his brother. <laughs> Which That's is interesting. Okay. Huh? <laughs> it's also. But wh why does he so much want to please his brother? We don't get any yeah. background to that. <laughs> And there is also, just to go back a little bit, uh, there is the curse which was there and also because of which they were born. And it's also said that Diti and Kashyapuni united at a wrong time. That also affected yeah. their disposition. 
so yes multiple factors uh, do affect it so we don't know yeah uh, what all would affect where the there's a sense of convergence of influences isn't there the different things come together there's oh, the okay. convergence that's a good it's, word it starts with the four kumaras wanting to come to vaikuntha the obstruction the curse then there's dt uh and so these things kind of converge to make make this event and that leads into another consideration of this story uh that eventually uh comes to the appearance of varaha and that is uh swayambhuva manu i would say uh swayambhuva and his wife what is her name atri no that's pritu's wife shata shata shatarupa shatarupa yeah shatarupa so i was thinking in a sense Swayambhuva and Shatarupa are sort of opposites of Diti and Kashyapa. Um, they are, well, Swayambhuva is also opposite of the four Kumaras, and Prabhupada mentions that in a purport. Uh, he mentions how the four Kumaras were disobedient to Lord Brahma. Uh, for good reason but they were disobedient <laughs> and swayambhuva is obedient uh, brahma wants him to procreate and he's very submissive to that um uh, will of brahma and uh he just has this this one doubt he says he expresses in a very humble way um where should i where should i propagate <laughs> the species the earth is there's no earth where what am i supposed where am i supposed to go <laughs> oh that's true so anyway the but uh, the point was that dt in her passion insists uh, that let us unite now because now is my desire and um and swayambhuva is manu is in a sense the opposite of that he is he is self restrained and he wants to first have the right situation for for the uh propagation so this then leads uh to the appearance of varaha that's interesting and so i am who manu if we consider from in there's devahuti and devahuti and kardam also perform austerities and then there is the appearance mm-hmm. of kapila over there yes. so it's it's almost opposite trajectories yes yeah. so you know when you mentioned the point of convergence so i think that's that is the level of understanding we can get specifically which factors cause how much i don't think we could ever put a put a percentage on or a figure on that <laughs> calculations <laughs> yeah yeah i i was asked one question apparently there's some pop, book on karma and destiny which is quite popular in india which says that something like they put a mathematical figure 25% of your who you are is determined by your past lives 25% is determined by your upbringing 25% is your association and 25% is your free will so it seems very convenient but i don't think things are that simple so krishna says gahana karmano gati so but we could say all those are factors so hiranyaksha now when he wants to please his brother also that that itself is indicative that there is whom we want to please also indicates not only it influences but also indicates our disposition why does he want to please him simply because he is his brother or does he want to please him because they both share the similar values and currently he happens to be in that position of authority where as a younger brother he has he offers him some deference and some respect 
So, that. but you can also say, uh, putting aside question of disposition and so on, that this suggests that uh, there is at least a, a grain of virtue uh, to desire to please anyone. Um, in a general sense, is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's it's a very human human, we may say, thing or desire to please another. And we can also uh, look at it in terms of filial piety, if you like. Um, I forget now which one is the older and which is the younger. I think uh, Hiranyaksha comes, is born second or first? Yeah, it's, it's, it's they very... were con conceived first, but he was born second. So Hiranyakashipu right. is considered the older brother. Okay. <laughs> so from that perspective, Hiranyaksha is being a pious younger son, a younger br brother. Yes. And that's uh, the idea of filial piety is, of course, they're very strongly in Asian traditions generally, including China, especially China. Um, there's five different relationships cl in classical Chinese for, um, and they're all hierarchical. So one of them is, I think, senior, older brother, younger brother. And the, the younger brother's position is always to uh, satisfy the older brother, or to, oh. at least to respect. So from that perspective, you can say, you know, Hiranyaksha is not a bad guy. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's filial piety. I, I just, it's two words or it's one word, filial piety. Or both are there. Filio, one word, F-I-L-I-A-L, -I -I filial. Yeah, filial piety, okay. I was I had not heard of that word. I thought it's filial piety, something like, a, no. okay, filial piety, makes sense. So in one sense, the example the on the positive side of this is, say, Lakshman and Ram or Bharat and Ram, mm. uh, devotion to virtue leading to, leading to like manifestation of virtue among the younger brothers also. So... On the other hand, from that perspective, you can also understand for Vibhishan to go against Ravan was quite a demanding, quite a bold and difficult thing to do. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you're saying in Chinese culture also as an in Indian culture, this filial piety is important. I hadn't heard the term, but that concept is very much there. Hmm. In yeah, in, in Confucian tradition especially, uh, it's, it's, it's considered foundational. Society is founded upon uh, this principle of, um, I forget the Chinese term for it, but it's, it's, uh, it's this hierarchical recognition, the king and the, the servant, the it's very patriarchal also, the husband and the wife, the father and the son. I think the father-son relationship is considered to be the, the core. Uh, and then from that come the other hierarchical relations. Oh, okay. But it's, it's, uh, it's not, there's some subtleties to the Chinese tradition. So for example, the son is um, is allowed to, in fact, expected to uh, give good advice to the parents if if he or she feels that the parents are doing something which is not good, which is not for their benefit, whatever, uh, then he should advise them. Uh, but he. He can never go against ultimately whatever the parents decide. So it's a very uh, strong idea in that tradition. Oh, okay. So, so in one sense, the Bhagavatam is a bit subversive, where it goes against all hier conventional hierarchies, where Prahlad gives advice, and not just only advice, but also goes against Hiranyakashipu. Mm. 
Indeed. But of course, the way Prahlad does it is um, he never overtly defies his father, does he? When his father asks him questions, he just answers honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He is, in a sense, you know, Prahlad's uh, example is a good example of how to, uh, how to differ without being disrespectful. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 Asur, now, Asur Varya Dehi now, you know, best of king, best of demons. That's, yes. That's not, a, that's not an insult. You're the best. <laughs> that's oh, a, best of the demons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, filial broad, broadly refers to broadly family and one's clan. Isn't it? Uh, so, maybe something parallel to it could be what the Bhagavad Gita calls about as Kula Dharma. Hmm? And Arjuna mm-hmm. is concerned, how can I if, I, if I kill my elders, if I kill my relatives, the Kula Dharma will be destroyed. So, right. I don't know, at least in the Hindu context, I have not seen the word filial piety used, but Kula Dharma is quite a prominent consideration in the Mahabharat. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, Maharaj. So, so, the point you are making is, we can see virtue even in somebody who is considered to be uh, demo, demoniac. So Hiranyaksha had the virtue of being a, a filial, some amount of filial piety. Yes, well, I, we had uh, last, I guess it's a year and a half ago now, uh, we had Nrsinga uh, Chaturdasi Festival in Germany. Hmm. And uh, we had, f- um, there were several of us giving the morning, the morning lecture one after another. Uh, including myself and also uh, His Holiness Kadama Kanana Swami. Hmm. And we got into this sort of spontaneous uh, debate, which became, it became quite entertaining and humorous. Uh, but I was trying to defend Hiranyakashipu and say, you know, we have to look at his background, we have to consider and so on. And um, he also had, you know, emotions, feelings. I was making some arguments like that. And then Kadama Karana Swami said, no, 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 I don't buy it. He said, he was completely demoniac and therefore he had to be killed. There's nothing There's nothing nice, there was nothing nice about him. So it became like a courtroom (laughs) sort of, we we started having like a debate. And from that, I got the idea, which I have yet to pursue. I started to make some notes, but I, I would like to write a drama. And the drama would take, would be, focused on Hiranyakashipu and maybe also Hiranyaksha um, after both of them have been killed and before they take birth again as as Ravana and Kumbhakarna and they are in the court of Yamaraj and the discussion is where should they go or what what happened and where should they go and and you know what is their what is the just uh, punishment for them and so on and there could be lawyers and uh, you know some arguing you know uh, there can be uh, the the um, the priest of the demigods brihaspati and like that Amazing. So a lot, a lot of what we, uh, what we read, in one sense, in the Puranas, and the uh, epics, Mahabharata, Ramayana, one could say that these are, despite their details, they're still, um, they're still leaving gaps. There's still something not described, something not given full attention. Yes, I think that's very much there. And that's why there is a later... And that, 
Yeah, sorry. That what's left out seems to me, it seems to me what's left out is left for us to reflect on. Yes, Maharaj. First of all, this is a beautiful idea to use. We had discussed earlier podcast about using our imagination in Krishna's service. So yeah, that's a brilliant idea. And <clears throat> there are many narratives of the Ramayana as well as and especially of the Mahabharat, which are from the many from the from the perspective of the characters on the dark side. So one of the most popular mm. and influential renditions of the Ramayana of the Mahabharat. In, at least in Maharashtra and elsewhere, Mrutyunjay, which tells everything from Karana's perspective and how yes. life was always unfair to him. And it creates a lot of empathy for those characters. So yeah. I haven't seen till now, say like a, a, somebody who is faithful to a tradition, some, a devotee or an exponent of dharma writing on these, then we could, we could you know, concede good where there is good but at the same time point out where there is bad there is one one tendency would be to paint these characters entirely black and the other mm. tendency would be to to exempt them from all wrong i'd say you know it is so many things unfair happened to them that's why they did this <laughs> yeah <clears throat> prahlad prahlad doesn't seem to do either he he seems to withhold all judgment on his father isn't it he just wants the best for him. And so he he requests Nursingadev afterward. Of course, now we're getting into the next avatar. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot to, if we continue this thread of discussion, there's a lot to discuss at that time also. And maybe we could uh, look at specific verses and discuss at that time. Mm. Yeah. So, so if we consider the convergence explanation, so we could say there are two negative influences for his demoniac nature. One is the curse from curse from the Kumaras, and second is the his birth at the inauspicious time. And there is, we could say, uh, I don't know if you want to use the, the his uh, conception. Uh, his conception. Their conception at an inauspicious time. Yeah, not birth, conception, right? And then there is, we could say, a positive factor which leads to his negative behavior. That is filial piety. So sometimes loyalty can be misdirected. And uh, so we appreciate the loyalty, but at the same time, we recognize that the effect of that loyalty has not been, is not necessarily healthy. So, <laughs> yes. so it's interesting when I, I read that past time that it's he challenges Varuna and after he challenges Varuna says, oh, you will, I'm not fit for fighting with you, but you will soon find someone who will destroy your pride. And yes. so Varuna is the Lord of the gods. So he's the lord of the he's the lord of the waters, and it's interesting the avatar who manifests over there manifests in water. Yeah. That so it does seem that the very area where he is he's claiming this is my turf, or he's trying to dominate the overlord of that particular area, the supreme mm. lord appears over there. He and says, "Okay, you like this water business, so I will appear this way. Why not?" Yeah, that's true. Beautiful. Mm. <clears throat> and then I think he uses the word, oh, an amphibious beast. That's one of the I words. was just going to say, yeah, but the word that is translated as amphibious beast, mm. uh, which comes again a, a few verses later, is vanagochara. Oh, okay. Vanagochara. Which, of course, means one who goes in the forest. Or one whose one who's, uh, terrain, one whose place is the forest. Um, it comes again. I noted it's here somewhere. But he's, uh, yeah, it's just interesting that he's referred to that Prabhupada. I don't know if it was Prabhupada or if it was uh, Pradyumna Prabhu <laughs> in the word oh. for word in translation. That's one of those things. But it kind of fits because uh, he's in and out of the water, so to say. Yeah. So it seems as boars, they don't constantly live in the water. So No. 
the most of the time we have we have bores right uh, i'm living right now in a place uh, which is directly adjacent to a re- fairly large forest and uh, we see boar tracks all the time in the forest there are boars here oh okay so <clears throat> I just look. I just found that verse. Yes, it's jaha sa chaho vana go charam charom rugaha. So yes, vana go charo. Ah. So when he, but they encounter each other in water, and most of the fights seems to happen in the water, mm. or at least by the water. Mm. It's not exactly clear. I think. Yeah, there's not much description of. say water splashing and everything they meet in the water maybe no. they come out because yeah. it's more a description of of they they dodging the blows and like that the weapons being hurled and weapons being caught there is no description and, of the water getting disrupted and weapons so being lost yeah yes. weapons <laughs> that's true so probably <laughs> they came out of the water they met each other in the water so you know here we had discussed a theme If I if I can go to the next theme, or you want to add something on this? Yes. No. About the Let's earth. Let's go ahead. Yeah, about the earth uh, and protecting the earth. So here there is this whole idea of the literal and the metaphorical, and somewhere in between the reality. So yes, one of your favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's my favorite, but I think for a rational, if you are to observe the lila from a rational perspective, that does come up. So yes. i was currently uh, i was currently studying the fifth canto cosmology and the bhagavatam doesn't say that at least it doesn't use the literal words that rahu and ketu for example they devour or they eat sun and moon for the at the time mm. of eclipse it just says that it they obscure it or cover the influence depending on uh. how the sanskrit is translated so yeah. in this case the earth it it is there is a very literal or physical description that the earth had fallen down into the ocean and the earth was lifted up and he was balancing him in his snout so and there's also some sort of description that apparently hiranyaksha uh, had had disrupted the balance of the earth by taking a lot of gold from it he was he was cra- he was uh, he had hiranyaksha he had an eye for gold that's one reading i had uh-huh. that you know he was very greedy for gold and I, that's nice i for gold okay <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> so because of that the earth's balance had got disrupted and the earth had suck, had fallen down into the ocean so yeah. to what extent is this uh, to be taken literally because if the earth had fallen then had everybody in, on the earth been killed at that time they had gone under the ocean or it was just for a few moments <laughs> yes, I mean to say um how literal. I don't I don't feel like it's necessary to think in too literal terms here. Um because it, it is hard to imagine what what is that what would that mean. Mm. Uh but at, at the same time uh from Bhaktivinod Thakur we get the sense with Krishna's pastimes of killing the demons that they are allegorical and at the same time they're not no less actual we don't have to have one or the other there can be both yes so uh, in any case it's also interesting that hiranyaksha at one point says uh to there there's a lot of verbal exchange there's a lot of insulting that goes on uh between hiranyaksha and varaha as a sort of um uh, i think somewhat formulaic um um what's the word i want there's there it's part it's kind of a ritual before you have a a fight uh first you insult each other yeah and uh by getting by insulting you get the other person angry 
and the other person gets you angry, and then you can really have a good fight. So, so one of his insults is one of Hiranyaksha's insults, as I remember, is uh, this is our territory. This the earth belongs to us. Us meaning the demons. Yes, we are. We are in charge of the lower, the lower area, the lower spheres realm. Yes. And so, I just shared the screen in case you want. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. This earth is entrusted to us, the inhabitants of the lower regions. And you cannot take it from my presence and not be heard by me. Yes. <laughs> That's very interesting. Hmm? <clears throat> yes, Maharaj. And uh, on the side of inf, uh, insults, saying, oh, an amphibious beast. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, that's interesting. That's a kind of it's it's a, an insult. Now, Prabhupada also used the word uh, rascal. What is the, is there a word for rascal? Oh, I don't know. You mean, is he translating some Sanskrit words? I don't yeah. know. You rascal, you have been nourished by our enemies to kill us. Uh, so, Paroksha Jita Yoga Maya Balam. I don't think there's a... Okay, Mudha it is there. So, pro, it's full Mudha, Prabhupada. yes. Prabhupada translated that. What, I know very well one time, you know how many times Prabhupada would say fools and rascals. Yes. And one time he said fool something about fools and rascals and then he paused and he said fool means rascal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> fool means rascal. Okay. <laughs> so in a sense at least the way the so word So there's no excuse, you know. You may say oh I'm just foolish. No, you're a rascal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, if you consider at least in today's usage, the word fool seems to be a little uh, not as strong as rascal. Unless, of course, rascal is used in a, in a more of a mischievous sense. Oh, you are such a rascal. He's such a rascal. Mm, but, so I, I heard that in Prabhupada's times, when Prabhupada learned his English in Scottish Church College, 1920s, Rascal at that time was not that stronger term. It was more like an affectionate form of reproach. Mm. Well, I think it is today as well. Oh, it's today? I, I think, think it is. Yeah. I don't know. You don't hear the word rascal in, in public discourse. Yeah, that is true. You don't, you don't hear the word rascal. So it's a little bit quaint. Quaint, okay, yeah. There was a comedy uh, series on television um, when I was a kid. I think it was from before I was a kid called uh, something, The Little Rascals. Oh. It, was about th it was about three boys who would always get into trouble, you know, and some, some humorous thing was happening. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just look at this. It says, Rascals are mischievous, but their intentions are to have fun rather than to be cruel. Uh, so a clown is a rascal, but a robber is not a rascal. A robber is a criminal. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it seems even now that the same thing is true. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so there is this problem for Svayambhuva Manu that there is no place. And one very broad thing we may want to think about with the Bhagavatam is the problem of creation. Lord Brahma has a lot of trouble uh, doing his job, which is creating, creating the world, creating the universe. And there are all, always these reversals. Hmm. And one of the reversals is, is this. And of course, that's the function of one of the functions of the avatars in general is to solve such problems. Okay. 
uh, to, to fix things so that the creation and its purpose can, can go on in its, uh, in its proper way. So Dharma can be practiced. So there's no question of practicing Dharma because there's no place to do it. And uh, <laughs> Swayam Bhuvamanu is very polite in his presenting this problem <laughs> to Lord Brahma. And then Lord Brahma, what does Lord Brahma do? He thinks about it. Hmm. Hmm, what to do? <laughs> and there's no sense given that Lord Brahma, because his body is constituted of buddhi, isn't it? He is the embodiment of intelligence, so he can think of something to do. Uh, but he doesn't exactly seem to, he doesn't seem to exactly think of what to do. Rather, the Lord just appears. But where does he appear? He appears in a very strange place. <laughs> he appears through the nostril of Lord Brahma. Hmm. Now, here I have to confess, I thought of an interesting connection to uh, the four Kumaras as they're attempting to enter Vaikuntha. As we know, uh, there's a famous verse, uh, wh when Lord Narayan comes, uh, as soon as the four Kumaras see Lord Narayan, what happens? Tasyara vinda nayanasya padara vinda kinjalka mishra tulasi makaranda vayu. Antargata svavivarena chakarate sham sankshovam akshara jusham api chittatan vo. So antargata svavivarena, entering into their nostrils through their own nostrils is the aroma uh, of the Tulsi mixed with sandal uh, at the lotus feet of the Lord. That entry into their nostrils is their experience. That's their first powerful experience of the Lord, uh, which uh, has the result of Sankshobam. Hmm. It, uh, it's transformative, it agitates for change, sankshobam, aksharajusham, api, although attached to impersonal Brahman. So this was their conversion story. And it all happens because of their nostrils. <laughs> oh, okay. And of course, okay. Okay. Of, of course, they were attempting to enter Vaikuntha and they were obstructed, so they could not enter, but the Lord entered them. And now we have Lord Brahma thinking what to do, what to do. And what happens? The Lord comes, emerges from his nostril. Oh, that's a striking correlation. Okay, and it's. I think it's another example of uh, of divine humor. Also, like who would have thought to appear in that way? Only, only the Lord would think to yeah. appear out of the nostrils of Lord Brahma, and you know he's having some fun. <laughs> That's amazing. So. Uh, this aspect of the Lord appearing through the nostrils, it's not exactly described in this section, isn't it? In this section, it is just Varahadev is already there. No, the description of his appearance uh, goes back to... Um, I think the ninth or 10th chapters, I think. Uh, chapter 13. Oh, before the chapter about the uh, Kumaras going up. Okay, 
it's a nested story it's the appearance it's, of arayana uh, okay. yeah right right yeah. chapter 13 is that's the name of the chapter itself okay yeah hmm. so i was wondering whether there are any living beings that reproduce uh, through the nose i don't think there's anything like that <laughs> <laughs> Or... no i don't think so <laughs> and to me the point is that um whereas the only thing that comes out of our nose is something not very nice you know we blow our nose and get rid of it um but when it comes to lord brahma and uh, the lord then it's a different story yeah the, the lord himself comes but but he's coming in this very strange form of a wild pig and i like to i like to um sort of joke with devotees that if uh we are presenting ourselves to people who are not familiar with our tradition it might be difficult for them to appreciate that you start out by saying yes we worship god as a wild pig <laughs> oh god <laughs> you yeah, this is even more wild people talk about what is the word for an zoomorphism or animal yeah, worship zoomorphism but they talk about uh, a monkey god hanuman yeah but a boar god would be a little too stretching things a bit too much that's a bit too much yeah <laughs> <laughs> tortoise god boar god fish god <laughs> hmm but with, in cultural conceptions uh is a boar considered positive in any culture like uh pigs are considered uh, a little bit unclean and at least in the vedic culture i don't know how it is in other cultures actually pigs uh can be very clean but they wallow in the mud because it keeps them cool oh, and okay. of course because they they will eat practically anything therefore they're generally considered unclean but from one source i read um the boar i think this is in india is given credit for showing humanity how to plow because one thing that boars do is they dig up because they they eat roots oh, in fact okay. we ex- we experienced that right here where i'm staying uh the one night they came and they dug up uh one small area just outside our main courtyard but in one night the whole a field of uh i don't know say 200 square meters maybe more I uh, was completely dug up <laughs> by the boars. Per meter. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So then that also we could say correlates with uh, Varaha Dev's attraction for the earth. He's Varaha yes. is often considered to be the consort of the earth or earth is considered to be his consort either way. Consort. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So and of course uh, Varaha is Yeah. There's the, also a description the, that he was sniffing the earth, so which is, which is also related with that, burrowing the earth. He was what like nursing, was sniffing, sniffing the earth. Oh, sniffing, yeah. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, you were saying something, Maharaj. Uh, just that Varaha Dev is. There are Varaha temples in India, and Var. varaha deities and in mathura there are two uh, varaha deities i've always wanted to go and see them but i never managed uh, but these are uh, said to be at least one of them established by shatrughna the brother of rama oh okay I had no idea about this. In this is in Mathura the temple. Oh. There's I think two temples and years ago um one devotee who had done a bit of research 
said that there's a very ancient uh, community of Brahmins in Mathura, and their their Ishta Devata is Varaha Dev. Oh, okay. And, and this got me wondering, now comes, I have to always do some speculating. So here's my speculation about our, our uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava book of uh, ritual is the Hari Bhakti Vilasa. Hmm. And there are a lot of mysteries about this book. Um, I spent some time studying it and there are some fairly strange things about it, but um, one thing I came to suspect is that Gopal Bhatta Goswami and Sanatan Goswami compiled this book for one purpose was to show the local Brahmins, these Mathura Brahmins, that we can be just as uh, as involved in ritual as you are. We can do as much ritual, if not more, <laughs> than you do. Oh, okay. Um, because they could very well have been considered by the local Brahmins. Oh, who are these? Who are these uh, upstarts coming from Beng? Coming from where? Coming from Bengal? Oh, come on! There's there's no Brahminical culture in Bengal. Of course, Gopal Bhatta came from South India. Anyway, that's my speculation. But about uh, deities of Varaha, hmm. um, there's also Varaha Nrsinga at Singachalam on the yes. east coast, south of Puri. That deity is combined, Varaha and Nrsinga. Yes. That's beautiful. So. And that, um, a sort of explanation of that is that's right on the coast. And this, as I remember the story they tell, I visited there decades ago. Uh, the story uh, is that this is the place where uh, the minions of Hiranyakashipu attempted to kill Prahlad by throwing him over the cliff into the sea. And he was saved, they say, uh, by the Lord in this form, the combined form of uh, Varaha and Rasingha. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I heard the story. So Varaha and Narasimha. And again, now we could associate Varaha with some kind of water association because when he was yeah. thrown into the water, he was saved over there. That's yes. fascinating. Mm. Also, uh, I just came across this a few days ago because I wanted to be thinking about Varaha, Dave. There's, uh, maybe you can look this up on, on the internet. There's a, a very large stone Varaha Murti in a place called Eran. If you go to Wikipedia. Yes. And search Eran, E-R-A-N. It's a oh. town in central India. And yeah. if you scroll down, I think you'll see an image. I'm just coming to that. This very, very large image of Varaha. Amazing. I think I shared it just now. Can you see? Yes. Um, Mandapa of the if, temple, Vishnu. No, if you scroll further down. You see the Varaha temple, okay. Oh. Yes, there. Colossal. Eran, colossal boar statue. <laughs> how big is it? Now, quite big. I don't know how big, but I think... Uh, it's huge, yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's some kind of tradition of worshipping Varaha Dev, which goes back to very ancient times. Now, notice also what looks like inscriptions on the side of the murti. 
Well, one thing also, you can see Boo Devi is there in the form of a female figure. Oh, okay. And she's kind of holding on, it looks like, to his um, tusk or something. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there are, you can sort of see lines, par um, parallel horizontal lines along the body. And I don't know if they're inscriptions or what, but uh, the point the point is, if you remember, in the appearance of Varaha Dev in the Bhagavatam, he is worshipped by the the sages and the demigods as being the personification of the yajna. Hmm. And it describes uh, in the Bhagavatam, it identifies several features of Varahadeva, of his physical form, as being different aspects, different items or elements of the sacrifice. Oh, okay. I thought that, uh, that is that a specific description for Varahadev or is it a generic description for any manifestation of the divine? No, no, it's Varahadev. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if I can find now. I can look for it. This is in the prayers Brahmaji is offering. Yeah, I found it's, it. Uh, it's in chapter 13. Yeah, I found it. I am sharing it, Maharaj. Okay, Rishaya Uchu. So it's uh, 34th verse onwards. Is there on the shared screen also in case you want to see there, Maharaj? Mm, yes. It's not just one ver verse, it goes yeah. on from there. Yeah, it's three, four, five verses. Your semen is sacrificed called Soma Yagya. Oh. Yeah, so it's all about sacrifice. So there's this association of Varaha with, with Vedic sacrifice. That's interesting. And this. It would be interesting to do more research to see what is that association. It's it's like he is a kind of uh, virat rupa of the sacrifice. Yeah, but yeah, where is that? Where is that all trailing back to? I don't know if that's something. Could be something in the brahmanas, the uh, you know the shatapata brahmana or something. Yes. I had when I had read this, I had thought of Virat Rupa, but I did not think of this idea that Virata Rupa of Yajna or something like that. That's very striking. Now mm. I once did a study of the various uh, prayers or descriptions of, of the universal form in the Bhagavatam, a comparative study. But I didn't find anything about sacrifice to that this extent, like going over several yeah. verses. And there's a general description yeah. that he is a Yajna Bhok or Yajna Purush. Like yeah. that generic descriptions are there, but these are very specific. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. And so. there's another thing about Varaha Dev's appearance. He appears first uh, from the nostril, and he's described as being the size of a thumb. Oh, so that's similar to almost similar to Matsya. Where Matsya is very small yes. and then he becomes large. And then he expands. Yeah. So uh, we have, I think, we're going to have altogether three expanding avatars. There's Matsya, there's Varaha, and uh, there's going to be also Vamana. Vamana, yes. Now, I don't know, at least there are not many Matsya temples, isn't it? Varaha temples to be more, seem to be more than Matsya. Yes. Just look at one, there seems a Matsya Narayan temple in Chennai. Achha. There's not, but it seems to be a recent temple built by, at least like a recent temple. It doesn't seem to be a traditional temple. So, <laughs> so if we consider so the avatars, popular. yeah. So if we consider the various avatars, which all are worshipped regularly, we don't even have a Matsya appearance day, isn't it? From what I know, <laughs> <laughs> that's celebrated amongst the fish. <laughs> Among the fish, okay, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's true. Mm -hmm. So, 
so we have varaha mahadwarashi yeah varaha mahadwarashi we have that big festival uh, so maharaj just going back to your point of sacrifice this also seems to be a part of the subversive thread that normally pigs or boars would be kept away from a sacrifice that mm. they would consider to be contaminating sacrifice but here the lord in the form of a pig or of a boar is considered to be the object of sacrifice the personification of the object of sacrifice so which is remarkable it is and uh, if you think about object of sacrifice that sounds like okay so boars would be uh animals that are victims of sacrifice but as i understand okay but as i understand uh vedic sacrifice when they do sacrifice animal it's always a domestic animal not a wild animal interesting yeah it, it may be a horse okay horse cow goat and uh, what else there's there's five one is <laughs> one is uh, purusha <laughs> human yeah. sacrifice <laughs> there's a big debate about that was that ever done or it's just uh you know token mentioned there is no ma- description of dogs being sacrificed also then all the domestic animals are there dog sacrifice i don't know i never heard of that yeah dogs as i understand in in traditional indian culture they are they're liminal liminal animals they're not they're not exactly domesticated and they're not wild they're kind of in between oh okay they live around humans and of course they benefit from humans um but uh they're not exact in of course now in modern following the west they've become d- domesticated and we have people with dogs in their apartments and so on yeah um, but but the more traditional uh condition of dogs in india is what we see mainly in the villages right the the dogs of the village they're just that's true and it's interesting recently somebody was mentioning to me that there's not much mention of cats in the scriptures like cats and dogs are popular pets now so dogs are yeah. lauded at least for their loyalty although uh, yes. and obedience but cats are not mentioned much that way mm. isn't it no so, no i don't i don't know about pet cats That's interesting. Right. Okay. But I think he has a pet dog, no? Yeah, I also remember reading about that in Gopal Champu. That he does seem to have pet. <laughs> yes. That's, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> so now going to the th- I mean, we talked about the boar. Uh, would you like to talk about the theme of say saving the earth? in relation to in relation to uh ecology environmental concerns i just think it it's nice to ref- to th- reflect on uh how the lord saves the earth because we we may feel a sense of helplessness with respect to i feel a sense sometimes in my lower moments uh that what we're doing as as a species to the earth planet is so disastrous um that there's only one way that this can be fixed and that is if the lord himself uh comes and of course we understand the lord has come and he has given uh the process for saving the earth namely sankirtana Mm. and and that is therefore what we do and lord chaitanya is therefore who we worship first and foremost but i just find it inspiring to also think of varaha dev uh as coming in this very special and surprising form 
and expanding himself and then effortlessly lifting the earth from its uh, condition of, we can say, degradation and, and danger. That's beautiful. So we could uh, focus on the broad principle rather than the specifics of the earth going into the water and being lifted up. So we could, the broad principle is that the earth is so dear to the Lord that he rescued it. And, uh, and says so the Lord can do the same thing again. Which is, which is so true. Yes. Yes. And he, he's, uh, he's full of surprises. So <laughs> we can, we can hope for some, something wonderful to happen. And of course, he is saving the earth, who is Bhumi, who is also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the same as Varahi, or uh, the, the consort of Varahadev. So he's very much interested to save, just as Ram saves Sita, so Varaha saves Bhumi, Hmm. And that takes us back to the fight with Hiranyaksha because that's mentioned in one verse um, explicitly that it's the fight was as if they were fighting over, um, you know, the prince. I forget how it's put. Uh, they're fighting over the. It's two men fighting over a woman. You know, <laughs> the, oh, the sort of primordial reason that men fight is. Uh, competition for a woman and Hiranyaksha thinks he's somehow going to enjoy Bhumi. That's fascinating. Yeah, I remember reading that also now. It's a very striking point because if we put aside the, we could say the morphological forms, then uh, there is, there are very, even the characters, like even the demons seem to have a lot of human emotions. So whether it's the devatas or the asuras, they also face human challenges. Their forms might be different. They might have certain abilities which we humans don't have. But broadly speaking, it is one way we can relate with them is because many of the emotions that they have or the challenges they face, they are quite human challenges. You know, I think you earlier also made that point about uh, humanizing, uh, humanizing even the characters on the dark side to understand them better. Yeah. So, yes. so when the Lord fights here, it's, uh, so it's interesting, Bhumi here is not described as talking anything or expressing anything. It's Brahmaji. No, she's... Yeah, Brahmaji who is expressing. He's urging the Lord, appreciating the Lord and urging him to please finish the demon. please. And then it seems that Varahadev casts an affection-filled glance at Brahma. So, mm. so the uh, Bhumi seems to be quite, uh, in this case, uh, we could say passive. And there's no description yes. of the Bhumi being personified over here. Like say in the first canto, where she and Dharma, the bull, the bull and the cow come together. There's no description yeah. like that here. And yeah. uh, so, and is there any explicit description about the Bhumi being a circle or a, being a sphere? Because being I, a I, being a globe, globe, yeah, yeah. I I I'm assuming that Bumi is a globe, uh, which kind of goes against the flat Earth people. But what to do? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, no, it's mentioned that uh, Varaha goes down. He picks up the Earth in, uh, from the ocean and he sets it. Isn't it? He sets it to float on the Garbhadaka ocean, isn't it? Yeah, he keeps it in, in such a way that it floats. Somehow it seems, it seems to infuse his potency or something in that by which he floats. Yes. Now, I suppose you could say, well, he could, uh, it could be a flat object, um, but I find that difficult to imagine. I think That's of it true. more as a globe. That's true. That's true. So uh, now, so when the Lord receives 
uh, or rather rescues and uh, protects the earth and he fights the demon so we could in a general sense say that this uh, this is like a inspiration for us to also on behalf of the lord fight against the forces that are disrupting the earth or disturbing the earth's balance so there is this verse in the bhagavatam where it says that swair dorbhir asya na dharmam at the force krishna he uh-huh. countered the forces of dharma sometimes by his own arms and sometimes by the arms of his devotees so uh-huh. swair yes. dorbhir and i think and prabhupada also in one purport he gives a very fascinating that explanation that verse is there in the gita that uh, everywhere are my hands and legs everywhere my eyes and ears and nose so yes. he he says that actually one explanation is that it's a super soul another explanation is that there are countless devotees and representatives of the lord and through them the lord is present everywhere so so in that sense we could also act as uh, representatives of the lord to to try to counter the influence disruptive influences and here is the challenge to uh, do it in the right mood um to to be in a spirit of um of prahlad who absolutely refused to get involved in political thinking of friends and enemies <laughs> I was meditating on this today because I come uh in this life from the US from America and they're mm. having this uh this election and it's it's a real uh sort of fingernail biting <laughs> situation. <laughs> yeah. And uh and everyone is very emotional about it. And I was just thinking this morning on one side i'm also feeling kind of emotional but on the other i'm feeling that uh after all we're aspiring to be like prahlad maharaj who refused that was his um his you know a special quality that he refused to uh be like his father who was uh, thinking only in terms of of politics of friends and enemies prahlad wouldn't have anything to do with it no friends no enemies completely completely neutral so uh so sa- saving the earth and being arms to save the earth as agents as instruments of the lord is is uh certainly a good thing now how to do that without immediately getting tied up in some politics uh yeah. in which we see only friends and enemies that's one of the reasons you know prabhupad also said that i'll be maybe i'll be the guru of the king i'll not i won't be the king because some extent if you become <laughs> if you get enmeshed in politics yeah. then avoiding that kind of vision would be very difficult so yes yeah you know, there's, there's, regarding maybe environment it's a big subject and i i will just mention yeah. a couple of things somehow this issue has become all, at one level environmental consciousness is good it's very good it indicates a, like earlier you said a desire to take care of something beyond oneself a desire to please or desire to take care so that's the expansion of consciousness uh, but in some ways it has become almost like another religion where some people who are who are out to save the environment they can also become a bit extremists in mm. you know this is all we have to do and anybody who is not con- not concerned about the environment it's almost like you are a condemned sinful person how can you be so 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 selfish so unconcerned whatever mm. so in a sense um like for some people environmental consciousness may be do, the way to spiritual consciousness because it is expanding the consciousness but sometimes and for some people environmental consciousness may become like a substitute for spiritual thinking yeah <laughs> oh yeah shrinking yes. yeah it may so in a sense if we focus on spiritualizing consciousness then environmental awareness will come in a way that will be actually healthy otherwise mm. it can become a 
it can become another form of uh, another ism as prabhupad says in the yeah. ishopishad yeah and i think the essential uh the essential principle to keep it spiritual is again what prabhupad how many times would say that krishna is the proprietor of everything ishavasyamidam sarvam so uh if we can help people to understand that point there is a proprietor mm. and it's not us <laughs> because the general when 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 the you know the eco saviors come uh who are not christian conscious um their their thinking is it's mundane because they're thinking uh we have to save the earth for us <laughs> yeah if we don't save it for us uh then then we are lost but the krishna conscious perspective is it is bhumi and bhumi is to be cared for as a mother and uh just for um for krishna we do uh, because she belongs to krishna and then krishna will provide for us as a result true and uh, you know in this sense if you, from that perspective say that the lord is reciprocating with brahma and quite often it is that the earth when she is in trouble she goes to devatas and they all go to brahma so brahma often seem brahma ji often seems to be the medium between say the rest of the universe and the lord who is transcendental to the universe mm. so so there are if we consider brahma to be broadly like a devotee and in this past time the earth is playing more of a passive role so it is the devotees they it is that as devotees we try to uh, try to um, either take care of the earth or pray to the lord on behalf of the earth and then through that it is we also reciprocate with the lord so you are not just reciprocating with the environment but we are also reciprocating with the lord so environmental consciousness actually becomes included within devotional reciprocations with the lord mm. yeah yes that's nice and on the other side um this brings me to a verse that i found uh striking in uh, canto 3 chapter 19 the killing of the demon hiranyaksha uh, verse 24 Okay. Uh, there's a there's a humor here also vinashta su svamaya su buyas chavraja keshavam rusho pagu hamano amum dadrishe avastitam bahi when the demon saw his magic forces dispelled he once again came into the presence of the personality of godhead keshava and full of rage tried to embrace him within his arms to crush him but to his great amazement he found the lord standing outside the circle of his arms <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful this comic situation we can picture it of this uh, big demon he he wants to embrace the lord to crush him and what well, where is he oh he's over there <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but also his his wanting to praise him i'm sorry his wanting to embrace him uh from the bhagavat sort of absolute perspective it means he's attracted to the lord he wants to serve the lord he wants to approach the lord he's he wants to embrace the lord <laughs> even he wants to you know it's like like uh putana wants to uh poison the lord but she's giving something so i was thinking of this in terms of what you were saying about the um 
the environmentalists, let's say the, the fanatic who is not God conscious, but only thinking we humans are going to save the planet. Uh, in a sense, they, they're not far away from these, from Hiranyaksha, uh, who uh, they, they will embrace the Lord to crush him and in the process, they miss him altogether. That's beautiful. That they kind of catch, but they don't catch him at all. And uh, in one sense, it's like uh, the idea that the Lord can, the Ushopanishad says that Manaso uh, Jayam, that he cannot be reached by the mind. He's situated at one place, yeah. but he cannot uh, be reached even by those who move yes. at the speed of the mind. Even Muni Pungavanam, yes. the Brahma Samhita also says that. Yes. So, yeah, I think there's also the, is the story of Kala Yavan in the 10th canto, where oh, yes. Krishna is just walking casually is it, <laughs> and he's chasing him, but he's not able to reach Krishna. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it never struck me that he wanted, so he wanted to embrace so that he could crush, but he completely yes. missed out. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> quite a Extraordinary. I think the gopis also pray that, uh, not the gopis, the Nagapatnis pray that, you know, how is it that you get th that this Kaliya has got the privilege of having his, having your lotus feet on his head. So this is, this is a privilege that hardly anyone gets. So he yes. almost gets the privilege of embracing the Lord over here. <laughs> he tries, but he misses. Yeah. <laughs> he misses, yeah. <laughs> and with respect to this humor, what you said? You know, uh, there are so many places which I never thought of it from a humorous perspective. It is funny if you try to visualize it. So it's almost like the, the fight goes on for quite some time. And then when he has to end it, he ends it very casually. There are all these yes. weapons being used, uh, used yeah, here. Yeah, he just there. kind of <laughs> he just slaps him <laughs> yeah. on, the on the chin or under the ear or something. Yeah, under the ear oh, some ways. And then he's finished. <laughs> So. And for that matter, I would say that the whole, uh, the way this fight is described, uh, the, the general feel I get from it is, um, it's a kind of ritual fight. You don't really get a sense of there's some really heavy thing going on here. I mean, it's a fight to the death, and yet um, you already know in advance that Krishna's that Varahadev is going to win. The demigods don't know that, and they're very worried. Um, but their worry strikes me as also pointing to their ignorance, which points to their. Uh, you know, sort of foolishness in a way. They don't know what's going, they don't understand what's going on. Hmm. So it's described, I think, even in the 10th canto that, uh, is it Aghasur? When Krishna is fighting with Aghasur, the demon, the devatas are peeking out from the clouds, but they're also going behind the clouds. They're afraid that if Aghasur <laughs> wins, then the Aghasur will be angry with them for cheering his opponent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, in one sense, uh, the scriptures narrated from the perspective of the omniscient narrator. So, we know more than the characters in the epics, also, in, a, in one sense. We know yes. the so we know that he's going to win. Mm. I'm just now writing about this uh, one article on the subject of. Um, reading the Bhagavatam as what I'm calling religious reading, uh, which involves repeated reading. And in repeated reading, we, we already know what happens. Um, okay. Repeated reading or hearing, sort of including all together. We mm. already know what's going to happen, but we want to hear it again. And you could ask, why do we want to hear it again <laughs> if we already know? <laughs> we, want, we want to hear it again because 
Well, two things. One is it's a reenactment. There's a sense that it's happening again, or it's it's still happening, it's ongoing. And we want to hear it again because we know that there's something about it that even we've heard before, now we're going to notice something that we didn't notice before. Some aspect of uh, what happens will come fresh. Nava Nava Rasa. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I was reading at one level, this applies even to some books which are considered like classic literature, say some novels like of Shakespeare or Jane Austen or whatever. People read them mm. again and again and again. And they, they get, I don't know about reenactment. It's like in great books, you can find so many layers of wisdom. But in books about Krishna, it's not just layers of wisdom. We also discover manifestations of Krishna over there or nuances mm. about how to relate with Krishna. So, yeah. so it's, you could say information is just like a preliminary aspect in that reading. There is so much more yes. than information. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I was reading a little bit about the word myth, although the word myth as a, in myth and mythology, we have a negative connotation to it. We don't say that yes. it's not mythology, but the way it is used in the, in the academia, it's not so much that it is unreal, uh, that it is more that it has some foundational value for some culture, for some tradition. Yeah. So often some, what yeah. they, when they use the word, say Hindu mythology or something like that, it's the idea that these stories are like mental homes for a particular tradition or a particular culture or civilization. And they keep going back yeah. to there again and again. So in one sense, uh, we could also say that uh, now how much somebody is connected to a culture or tradition could be seen not just by what kind of dress they wear or what kind of food they eat, but how much the culture's foundational stories have become like their mental home. And uh, yeah. so this part, I think this, the way we are churning, this also helps us to reside more and more in Krishna Leela. Yes. Mm -hmm. The idea that myth is false, uh, it goes back to Plato. Okay. Um, you know, Plato was questioning uh, what is all? What are all these stories? These crazy stories from Homer and Hesiod, um, and but 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 then Plato replay. He didn't say therefore down with myth. He created his own new myths. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, you know the story of the cave, uh, the men in the cave, and so on. Anyway, yeah, that's true. So I think but, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of discussion about what is myth, what is, how does, first of all, how does it function uh, in relation to society? It's often discussed in relation to ritual. There's a whole debate about which comes first, ritual or myth, uh, and. And then others say, well, why do you want to say one or the other? They're both, <laughs> they're inseparable. Okay. But yeah. there's something, there's a sense in which myth is touching a deeper reality. Yes. And one way I like to think of it is uh, that if we imagine a, uh, a wheel of a cart um, as it's rolling along the ground, it's touching the ground at, at you know, very limited space as it moves. Hmm. And so we have, we have the world, the, we have the transcendent realm, realm uh, which is represented by this wheel. Uh, which is turning and it's touching this world mm. in different points of time and space. 
And we perceive those points of time and space. And Prabhupada would often insist, this is history. It's not myth, it's history. So, okay, yes, it's history and that there is a real connection with, uh, with historical time. And at the same time, it's, it's transcendental, it's beyond this world, it's beyond our very limited perceptions. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it's not only history, it's uh, super history. This is a beautiful metaphor. So if I understand right, when you're talking about the wheel, that is not the samsara chakra. This is, you're talking about the wheel no, of no. transcendence. And where the yes. wheel is touching the earth, that is, that is material existence. So some aspect yes. of this, some, some aspect of say the Paramartha, the spiritual world that comes mm. in contact with the earth at particular times. So time and place, time and place. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. So the trans it's just an through. analogy. Analogies yeah. always have their limits, but no, no, of I course, find yeah. it helpful. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. So, so we accept that there is a historical aspect. And at the same time, we also talk that say, and we assert that there is a trans historical aspect to it. And yes, exactly. So then we could also say that when Krishna manifests at a particular time in history or geography, then his yeah. manifestation will probably take on some of the characteristics of that particular place and time. So yes. If Lord Chaitanya is manifesting in Bengal, he's not going to speak English at that time, he's going to speak Bengali. So like language and so many other things like that. But still what he's giving is transcendental beyond whatever is the regional. Yes. Yes. So um, I would like to suggest, I, I should uh, end soon. Yes, ma'am. But yeah. I would like to read one more verse if you want to find it. I think it's a nice verse to end on. Yes, ma'am. It's, uh, it's Canto 3, chapter 19, verse 31. Okay, I'm just <clears throat> Maitreya Uvacha Evam Hiranyaksham Asahya Vikramam Sasada Yitva Harir Adi Sukara Jagamalokam Swam Akandi Dotsavam Samidita Pushkara Vishtaradivi. Sri Maitreya continued after thus killing the most formidable demon Hiranyaksha. The Supreme Lord Hari, the origin of the bear species, of the boar species, returned to, returned to his own abode where there is always an uninterrupted festival. The Lord was praised by all the demigods headed by Brahma. So that uninterrupted festival, Akandita Utsavam, uh, of the spiritual realm, that is this wheel that I spoke of. Oh, okay. Or within that wheel, that festival is going on. Akhanditotsa. That's beautiful. There were Brahma Samhita says, Nitya Gai. He's always every walk is a dance, every talk is a song. So Akhanditotsa. Yes. yes. I think Prabhupada also said that if he had the resources, every day we could have a festival. So, yes. Akhanditotsa. Beautiful. Very nice words. So it's a, like a conclusion to the past time, but it's also a very sweet meditation on the Lord and his nature and his abode. A lot is there in this yes. world. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's beautiful. Very a nice note to conclude it on, Maharaj. Should I try to summarize quickly in a couple of minutes, in a few minutes? That's your expertise, please. I don't know. <laughs> you know we did discuss a lot of things today. So... So we broadly started this discussion by talking about Varaha Devam discussed two main things. One is uh, the role of the past in uh, shaping one's uh, life and one's choices. And the second we discussed about Bhumi Devi and the role of protecting the earth. So in the first part, we started by talking about speech acts where the act itself leads to some action like a judge or a priest pronouncing marriage. And so similarly, we have curses and benedictions, both acting in that way. And then we discussed that, you know, what all is affected by the curse 
is it just the situations the dispositions the decisions so to some extent it's a multiple things uh multiple levels the effect might be there and it's very difficult to diffuse to make it discrete but if you look at it from this life's perspective then why what made somebody behave in a particular way then we could say there's a convergence of factors from this life as well as previous life and uh, uh we talked about uh, hiranyak why was hiranyak so so violent so there is no description that he was specifically evil against people in general but in he wanted to aggrandize increase the power of his brother and please him so so that filial piety was a nice concept you you mentioned that we could say that is a virtue within him and but but it was misdirected because his brother was a demon and there are negative influences coming for him from two levels one is that the, the jay jay vijay had been cursed as per the plan of the lord so that he could have some maushal leela some fighting and then there was also conception of hiran of the two brothers happening at an auspicious time because of dithi's insistence so all that contributed to his his arrogant or violent bellicose disposition and then he he seems to as you said very straightforward in uh, his chal- he challenges varman he challenges varuna and in the water body itself bore appears and then we talk a little bit about the subversive conception of divinity as varaha so he is worshiped in fact he is considered as the personification of sacrifice all the normally bores would not be bores would seem to be contaminating sacrifice or some in some cultures not in necessarily in the indian culture that bores might be sacrificed um, there are normally it's cows or buffaloes or or some other animals like goats and others that are horses that are sacrificed and there in that connection we discussed more about this whole concept of how normally you said domestic animals are what are sacrificed and dogs and cats we had interesting this in dogs are liminal cats don't seem to be mentioned so much and the boar although the word amphibious beast is used it, it's more like a one uh, uh, animal one gochera one wandering in the forest and in that connection discuss about varaha uh, he is uh, when he manifests he has his affection for the earth can also be associated with the fact that boars bar- dig into the earth and they find a uh, edible food over there so his now the earth itself is passive here and so when the lord varaha reciprocates with brahma ji for uh, re- while rescuing the earth and then we discuss a little bit about Uh, the principle of rescuing the earth or protecting the earth today we can feel helpless sometimes seeing the sheer magnitude of the forces that are uh, disrupting the environment but just as the lord intervened to protect so we can also be hopeful that the lord can intervene at the same time we can also act as the arms of the lord for uh, for doing our part and then when we are acting as the arms of the lord we need to be careful to have the mentality of prahlad that we don't see friends and enemies like now even the environmental issue has become very politicalized in the us uh, presidential uh, presidential uh, elections so we need to avoid that friend and enemy mentality you also mentioned about prahlad being an ex- prahlad and bhishan being exceptions all the born in demoniac family they are not demoniac and he was although he stood firm to his principles he was never directly disrespectful to his father so then toward the we also discuss some cultural aspects we went to we saw in wikipedia some beautiful pictures of varaha dev varaha narsimha temple and other this giant colossal varaha temple in elam as we mentioned so it seems that there is uh, bhumi devi with him as his consort and uh, toward the end we discussed about this when bhumi devi is to be protected we don't want environmentalism to become like another religion rather we want it to be if we are practicing krishna consciousness is spiritually conscious then naturally we will have environmental consciousness and our consciousness in taking care of the environment is not that it is for us to live and enjoy it is she is the lord's consort and she is our mother and that's why we need to care for her as a part of our service to the lord and we also discuss a few verses 
so some there's some places there is humor where he tries to hug the lord embrace the lord to crush him but the lord disappears and then this concluding verse which you mentioned about how they he is the original boar he comes to the earth and he goes back and he there's akhanditotsav there is a eternal festival going on in the spiritual world and in that connection you mentioned about the idea of myth so myth is uh it is like a, a there is something there is historical but something much more than history so if you take the metaphor of the wheel the wheel is the wheel of trans, the spiritual world where eternal festivals are happening and sometimes those festivities sometimes that divine leela it touches the ground it touches the earth and it's manifest for us to to relish so we accept that the he the myths are historic what 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 is called as myths they were we consider the leelas are historical but they are also trans historical and if they become our mental homes then we can become absorbed in krishna and that can be actually a very sweet way of being spiritually devotionally conscious so <laughs> thank you very much maharaj this very good a lot of things <laughs> it's very relishable to have your sangha and to have so much stimulation of thought thank you thank for you so much of your time my pleasure so next time up is nursing a day huh yes mara i think we will we may need to have multiple sessions but we'll see how it goes and that's the matter yes <laughs> thank you very yes. much maharaj for your association and your sharing your thank you prabhu wide ranging as well as deep going nectar you go deep into shastra as well as you have like a broad knowledge about various things so it's wonderful thank you very much we we are churning churning the nectar Yes, Maharaj, definitely.